and welcome back to the program. You're listening to Zoo. <laughs> You're listening to Zoo. <laughs> You're listening to CJUM 101.5 FM at Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. And we're talking with Jeff Brown and his uh, book, Soul Shaping Adventures in Self Creation. What is Buddha Land? Well, and Buddha Land was a term that Ron Kurtz, the Hakomi pioneer, I, I, I don't know if he originated it, but I had read it in something he had written. And Buddha Land is just an experience that happened. It first happened when my granddad died, when I was, I guess, cracked open to a a more unified landscape, um, almost an experience of being in the world and out of the world all at the same time. For me, it's really the land where essence lives, where our true essence is. And, you know, it's kind of like it might be similar to the experience you had in your near-death experience when you're cracked open to a broader uh, framework of perception, a deeper reality, um, as opposed to a more localized lens that we normally operate from in our lives. The land of everything, right? Yeah. Could it be like where we're we're in touch with uh, collective consciousness and the collective unconscious? Yeah, I think it's where we're in touch with it all, where we see it from a broader place. We see the small thing, but we also understand that it's only a small part of the bigger whole. So it's the kind of thing that I think you have experience that you have to have in order to move forward on this path and know what you're moving towards. Is you know, I did a lot of intense breath works and I was cracked open. And sweats have this effect on people as well where they get out of them and suddenly they're not in their anxiety, they're not in all that defended stuff. They really experience their connection to everything, their place and everything. And for me, one of the confusing things about it at first was like it, I, I, I couldn't understand in this place where there was no self in a way, where my path was in it. It was like, okay, so I'm really part of the big picture. It's a big pie. And then it was like, okay, now where is my localized place in this big picture? And I think after my first Buddha Land experiences, then I began to address that. And ultimately, I actually found my localized path, my true localized path, which was to write the book, amongst other things, in the heart of some Buddha Land experiences. But yeah. you've got to spend enough time there, I think, to get comfortable and begin to understand that. Walking in the, the oneness of essence. Yeah, and then it's like, okay, well, if we're all one, then what about me? And then you come back after you've gone there, and, and that's an important question to address, because... If you go too far with we're all one, then you don't really believe in callings. You don't necessarily believe in callings or in an individual path. And I think the truth is that we all are all part of this giant Buddha land experience, part of oneness, but we do each have a particular role to play as part of it. Our physical bodies are the perfect example. Exactly right. We're not attached at the waist, in fact. Yeah. yeah. There is something called separateness. And, you know, the question is, what's the intention behind your separateness? Yeah. Yeah. So what is uh, the, the universal broadcasting system? Wow. I mean, that, you know, that's, um, that was the experience I had in my first Buddha Land experience. And I define it as the dynamic, um, benevolent network of relatedness that brings lessons and messengers onto our path in an effort to grow our soul to the next level of consciousness. So, you know, when you have what's called a coincidence, you begin to understand that there really is this whole network or framework that's outside of you that is uh, benevolently intended that is tapped into your individual path and tapped into the bigger picture that brings experiences your way when you're ready and sometimes when you're not um, in an effort to bring your soul to the next stage in its consciousness and in so doing bring everybody's soul vibration higher. Um, so to me it's the Divine Mother in action in fact that we're not just thrown here in some arbitrary way but that we're part of a network of relatedness that you know, pays more attention to us in a more positive direction when we begin to become conscious, um, gives us some very difficult lessons, often in the beginning, to wake us up. I call them a wake-down call, and I think that's what happens, uh, to summon our awareness that there's something bigger happening here. But to me, the UBS is really, I mean, it's the real truth of how it all happens, you know? You know? Yeah. What do you mean by when you're, when you're seeking a little solitude? Yeah, that's just uh, having some time alone with your soul self, you know. I mean, for me, that happened up north. I had a lot of associations with the city that were very tight and constricted, and so I would go up to the country a lot, and um, I would just try to get clear enough and clear away my urban business, whatever all things that were in my mind were, and uh, just spend time inside, make contact with my subtle or my soul self, and um, try to listen in, just, you know, befriend it. That's the emotional comfort zone? Emotional comfort zones uh, more uh, that we, I think this is one of the most important things we have to recognize in our awareness work on the path. 
which is you know how we habitually stay in a particular zone um, you know somewhere between armor and vulnerability so for example someone who has a drug habit kicks the habit but then without recognizing what's happening then develops a new addictive avoidant habit um, and what they're doing really is keeping themselves in the same range emotionally of vulnerability that they're used to and comfortable with I think to move forward on the path we have to extend our comfort zone so for example for me to I had a very strong abandonment wound that has has been very much a part of my journey and for me there was a point at which instead of kind of tripping out to avoid my abandonment wound with various different techniques I just decided to start sitting in the pain of it and I think what I was doing was trying to expand my emotional comfort zone so that I could now hold the space for that pain and still function in the world um, and, and, and doing that was essential to my being able to move forward on the path because otherwise I would just keep going back to my avoidant pattern right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. if you're in avoidance you're just not going to move forward on the path yeah, yeah you got to do some confronting and extending your emotional comfort zone getting out of the habit yeah yeah here's another question that you ask in the book how does one stay tenderly soulful in the heart of our vulture culture right <laughs> that's a good question <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't think there's an easy answer. There are a number of techniques that, you know, I, st- I worked on establishing good, strong, energetic boundaries. Ashtanga yoga help with that. So that the urban, you know, it's like when you walk out of a massage in the city and within five minutes, you're, I mean, you're so overwhelmed and uncomfortable, you close back down again. Yeah. So, you know, um, getting massage a lot helped me. Doing yoga helped me to come back to openness. Getting out of the city helped me. Um, taking little soul breaks in the heart of my daily life, you know, like playing your music in the car, even on your computer when you're at work, sort of like Enya music or anything that sort of softens your edges and opens you is helpful. Going for walks, hugging trees in the city is always a good thing. Um, Selective attachment, I call it, which is this idea of sifting all of our choices and experiences through an essential filter. So like if you're living in the city, and you keep getting invited out to bars, you decide whether or not that's really going to support your openness. You know, things like that, you know, avoiding busy city streets, you know, not driving unless you really have to, things like that. I think the thing that ultimately helped the most was actually honoring my calling. Once the calling got clear, staying in the book helped me so that I later in my journey reached a point where I could be in the urban environment and still stay open uh, because God was now everywhere. Whereas at first, God was only in little sound bites. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I think Lynn has a question. Uh, Hi, Jeff. Hi, Lynn. It's Lynn, uh, the board broad. (laughs) Yeah, that's what I figured. (laughs) I have a question for you. You had a definite path, actually two, in your sales ability, which, um, you know, you self-professed in your book. You were wonderful at. And then later on, uh, your legal profession, again, what seemed to be a natural way of going. Yeah. How did you pull back from that? Because that, that really is a heavy-duty pull. Well, like, the law pull, I mean, was so intense. I think this is, was why my journey was particularly hard. I mean, I article Freddie Greenspan in Toronto, and I was, we did a major league murder trial. I was really in it. I mean, I wrote a 167-page jury address in four days and nights. I'm not saying that for my ego. I'm saying that because that's an indication of how deep the path was. The groove was so deep in me. And walking away from that path, from my economic background of poverty, from my egoic background, so many different reasons, was so difficult. It's true. It was a natural. I walked into a court and it was like I'd been there forever. Um, but, you know, what it really comes down to is how strong is your faith in the little voice that knows, you know. And for whatever reason, and I don't even have any reason in my lineage that I could tell you why I trusted that voice, um, I just trusted it. I felt like, okay... You know, even in my teens, I had these, there were moments, and I didn't include them in the book, where I was like, I would see Eddie Greenspan on TV, and I'd be like, okay, I know that dude. I'm going to know that dude. And my family would say, you're, you know, you're a dreamer, you're poor, you'll never know that dude. But I knew that I knew that guy. And, you know, despite that, there was a voice inside of me sometimes that says, oh, you're just going to do law and then walk away. You're just going to do law and walk away. And I really believe that was my soul's journey. I had to complete the warrior path. You know, it was almost as though I'd been a trial lawyer in my past lives. Um, and being with Eddie was wonderful. So instead of being for 15 years working my way up to a murder trial, I got to do one of my articling year um, so I could, I guess, get on with it, you know, get into it and then get on with it. And um, it wasn't easy, though, you know. I mean, I missed law for, I don't know, eight or nine years. It was, it was physically excru- excruciatingly painful. It was like the loss of a great love. 
so you kind of met your crossroad. Oh, yeah, a lot of times, <laughs> you know, and um, and now what's really cool, like Eddie's on the website, soulshaping.com, he's a testimonial, and I went to see him a little while ago and brought him the book. It was like the completion, and he'd been upset with me, I know, like for leaving law, and he didn't understand it, and, you know, we were quite connected, and but um, now it feels perfect. I don't miss it at all. I totally know that I did what I was supposed to do. I feel real soul satisfied, but I had to stay in that regret and uncertainty for a long, long time to reach that stage. It was a real hard path to let go of. Yeah, I can kind of relate on on, on two different levels. Uh, First, where even where I'm at at this moment in time where I'm kind of, you know, I've been in youth care now for a while. Youth care? Yeah. What does that mean? I do uh, support work for CFS, which is Children and Family Services. Oh, great. So it's, it's uh, yeah, you know, working in uh, shelters for, uh, you know, adolescents. Mm-hmm. Um, but, it, you know, I've been really at a crossroads myself, and I don't know if I want to do this kind of work anymore. Mm-hmm. That was one of the things about reading your book was kind of like, you know, again, there's this similarity of, you know, you, you get to a place where your soul is going, you know what, man, we just, we don't want to eat that meat anymore. <laughs> it's enough. Yeah, it's, it's you've like got, you, you've got it. You've got the zeitgeist down, Pat. Now it's just enough. You're on to the next place in your journey, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, we were taught to have one career. This is the game. Yeah. And people, you know, jump around and people call them flakes. They just don't understand it, that the soul's not interested in necessarily one career. It's a multi-career path. <laughs> <laughs> At you, least for a lot of us it is, you know? Yeah, that's why I liked your chapter on uh, uh, befriending confusion and the place of not knowing, because that's the place I like to be at. I like that place of not knowing because I, I look at it and I've looked at it for a long, long time where I guess I, I surrendered a long time ago to the universe that, you know, you take me where I most need to go because I get in my way way too much. And so I try to stay out of my way. And how I right. do that is I, I try and listen to the universe. And so it takes me and I just ride the wave. Right on the UBS. I mean, they know they know what's in store for you. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, they really do. you got to have faith that that exists. Something exists outside of your own consciousness, right? Yeah. When you're living who and what you are and have trust in the universe, it yeah. will always take care of you. Yeah, one way or the other. It'll one take way or care the other. Yeah. It may not be how you expect it to no. be. No. You know, wish, you know, wishful thinking, the whole secret scene. I mean, you know, it's not always what you ask for. It's actually just what you need. I think the universe is attuned to what, what I call our cellular state. I mean, where we really are in our journey, what we need to get to the next place, independent of what we think we need to get to, to get to the next place. And I think that's what it brings our way most of the time. 